so I hope you still have some attention for uh, this tool because I think this could be for K and L one of the most important tool to use uh, that we offer uh, because it addresses directly to the vectorization, to the ZIMD vectorization and tries to make the process more easy and guide you through the vectorization process. So normally you read all the uh, output of the uh, compiler and get a little bit lost because you not know from the beginning what's the most important loop and you have to do profiling and then you have to see what's my vectorization uh, features that each loop has and the important loops and this tool addresses all these problems by uh, guiding you through the uh, pro process of vectorization. Uh, so first we start with an advisor overview. Uh, may I ask how many of you have already tried advisor? Okay. Uh, so I hope you will be motivated to, to have at least a look at it because the uh, way of using it is much uh, easier, I would say, than using VTune. So, um, let's come for the overview, the motivation. Uh, so, probably the f uh, known factors that prevent vectorization of your code. So, we might have loop carried dependencies, so we have A of R I plus M and A of I on uh, left and right side of the uh, equation, uh, which can, uh, of course, when the vector length is, uh, is bigger than, or let's say the, the offset here is smaller than the vector length, then you can have in one vector elements on the right and the left hand side. So that is a dependency. Uh, pointer aliasing, so the compiler does not know if uh, it's probably the uh, same vector on the right and left side here and after function calls. Uh, you might have function calls uh, inside uh, your code, inside your loop that prevents vectorization because the compiler does not know what happens. Normally you would say uh, with inlining you can cure that. Uh, then the loop structure, uh, the boundary conditions may uh, play a role so the compiler does not know about the boundaries in advance because it's a parameter as well. Or you have inner loop versus outer loop or just the, the cost of the uh, operations is, seems to be uh, too high for the compiler so it gives up. Uh, next step would be if you have vectorized loops, uh, how do you know if they are efficiently vectorized? So what factors can slow down your vectorization? So first of all, it's the indirect memory access. And just, it came to my memory when I, I started with, with HPC, uh, the, the vector machines of Cray uh, so the cost of indirect addressing was sometimes only a factor of two. But here it's most of the time much more than a factor of two to the peak performance. So you can, could always uh, even gain half of the peak with indirect addressing on a Cray machine that times. But uh, this is more impacting now. Um, you could have uh, the memory system latency throughput so when you have a plain loop and a very big index here, then you can run into bandwidth problems that prevent you from uh, good vectorization. Uh, then you might have function calls which are serialized. So um, you don't know what happens in the function and the compiler either. And if it cannot inline, then uh, this days uh, Okay, uh, it can try some intermediate kind of vectorization, but 
uh, it will be very uh, suboptimal if it does not know what happens, uh, really happens in this function call. Uh, you might have small trip counts, so it's very valuable to know about each loop, uh, how large the trip count is. The trip count, uh, you probably heard of when, when you vectorize that the compiler generates three kinds of loops. Uh, you have the, the P loop in the beginning uh, that's necessary to cope with the uh, alignment. And then you have the loop body. Uh, that is the real loop you, body you are targeting for. And then you have the reminder for everything that fit, in, fit the rest uh, that does not fit into a multiple of the vector length. And <clears throat> so when the trip counts are small, when the trip count is very large, then this reminder and P loop might not play a role in your application. But if it's very small loops, then uh, reminder and P loop might be uh, important. And you might have branches that uh, spoil your vectorization and uh, let your code run uh, slower than expected. Uh, many other stuff like uh, register spilling or floating point accuracy, FMA, uh, divisions and uh, squats unrolling, even AVX throttling. So this would be um, a workflow. Uh, probably don't go in, in detail through it. You can, can read it later in your copy. It just uh, yeah, starts here with a distinction between Zimdi loop and scalar loop. And then for the scalar loop, you have to shoot look for the so-called low-hanging fruit that you uh, just uh, sort out everything that you can fix immediately without much work first. And uh, yeah, on the other side, if it vectorizes, uh, then you should look for the low-hanging fruit as well. And if you do, uh, haven't done it, go to the beginning again, or then comes the deeper analysis that you look for the dependencies in the scalar loop or for the vectorized loop you look if it's probably memory bound loops then you have to address uh, something with the memory probably you have to uh, change the algorithm to have a better stride or change the loops here to have a uh, better fitting stride or if it's really a zimdi loop that uh, works well and probably you do some uh, unrolling or things to uh, increase the vectorization. So here's our five proposed steps to the efficient vectorization of vector advisor. Uh, sorry, I've taken a, originally there was Studio 2016 here. So it's already one year old, the uh, presentation, but basically the steps and the content is, is valid today and it's not much changed now. Now we're targeting already for the 2018 versions. Um, yeah, the first step would to take a so-called survey. A survey is more or less a profiling that you just take the timing and get some basic information that comes from the compiler directly, but probably uh, shown in a more uh, fancy way. So you see uh, you have the, the loops here. It's kind of profiling for each loop. And then you have some basic information like the self time. Total time is when it's a dual loop or when it does something inside the loop, then it's uh, split here into the total time that contains every inner loop. Uh, the loop type, if it's scalar or if it's vectorized, is already um, shown here. And when it's not vectorizing, then it gives a little reason for that if there's a dependency and you can go and work further on it. Uh, the next step would be to, uh, to look at this um, guiding stuff. And you sometimes, when you hover over it with the mouse, you get some advices here. 
and uh, you can now go through the advices and the guidance and it gives you some recommendation. For example, here it's recommending probably it found a peel loop and then it recommends you to uh, align the memory access. So you see it's a kind of an expert system where you are guided through the process of vectorization and gives, give, uh, are given automatic tips to improve it. Uh, the next step would be uh, to look for the trip count and you have to do another analysis to, to get the trip count. The reason is uh, that the first step when you do the, uh, the timings you don't want to interfere with the application and you uh, take a lightweight uh, collection of timings that does not slow down the application substantially. And when you want to take the trip counts, you have to really instruct everything. This is a so-called uh, pin library uh, that does an on-the-fly instrumentation and counts all the excesses and counts all the, the trip counts. And so this is, can slow down the application by, by factors, probably. And you should adapt your workload to that, not to wait too long. And then you get some trip counts. And if you mark it either on the GUI or have the right flag on the command line, uh, you also get the flops. So it's also uh, counting all the flops, all the, um, um, the Zimli operations, all the scalar operations, uh, and all the flops that results from these operations. Um, then you get an output here with the total time and the trip counts, uh, the iteration duration and the call count, which gives you valuable information to decide what kind of steps you will take next. If uh, trip count is low, uh, you probably have to look for the peel and reminder loops, or if it's large, then you can ignore this. And how often the function is called is interesting as well. And you, it's not shown here, but today, you, uh, if you uh, have this additional flag, uh, then you get even a gigaflop number and the um, arithmetic intensity, which I will talk later on. Um, the next step would be for the serial loops. Uh, you want to know if it's a uh, dependency. Uh, you see here, uh, it, it tells you in the first part if it's uh, an assumed dependency, but it can do deeper analysis for certain loops and you can see if for this workload there's a real dependency. But be careful, if it says here it's, a, uh, it's no dependency or if it's all right, right, then it's only the analysis for this one workload. Uh, I would say it's more valuable if you see there's a real dependency then, because then you know you have to work on it and change the algorithm to, make, to remove the dependency but if it says there's no dependency, then you uh, already have a good hint that there can be really no dependency, but I would uh, suggest to have a, even a deeper look before really changing uh, it by adding, for example, the pragma zimdi in front of it to force it to vectorize. Uh, the next step for the vectorized loops is to uh, judge the efficiency of the vectorization. Um, for that, it's crucial to, to know something about the memory access. So uh, there are three kinds of memory accesses are here traced. The one is the if you have stride zero, which means that you basically use the same value on and on, or stride one is ideal because that fits ideal into the uh, maps ideal to the vector registers. Uh, the next step, if you have a um, deterministic or a, a fixed uh, stride, which is here uh, printed in yellow, 
uh, shows you which uh, or what's the percentage of uh, fixed stride loops uh, or for, for a certain loop that it uh, runs with fixed stride memory. And red is the worst kind that would be if you cannot uh, predict the memory access, if it's really an indirect memory access. So there you can expect the worst performance or worst efficiency of your vectorization. Uh, there's something more. If you open it, you get the GUI, you get the summary view. So just a word in between. Um, my uh, way of working with Advisor or even with VTune is that I'm using most of the time the command line and generate results uh, with command line and then take the results to my laptop and view it there on the laptop because sometimes it can be annoying to if it's in a remote cluster to, uh, to start the GUI there. It's sometimes good for the beginning to work just with the GUI and uh, you are guided through the, through the workflow, but uh, if you're working on clusters, it might be good to learn more about how to use the command line interface. And when you have MPI applications and want to uh, get traces, then, it's, then you need to know about how to uh, work with the command line interface. So this is a summary view and you get an over, uh, overview of all the vectory efficiency about the gain here. We have a factor of 2.64 which is here 66%. So this is not AVX 512 and uh, a theoretical gain that we can, can reach. And then it shows us uh, the hot loops and you can uh, see where we are here on the first um, and here's a little bit more about the uh, total CPU time and the CPU time in vectorized loops and outs in scalar lo uh, loops and then the efficiency. So this would be uh, the overview of the survey if you just take the survey here and uh, we, we had this picture smaller even before. You see the hotspots, uh, you see the vector issues, uh, the time, total time, uh, the type of loops. So we have here a vectorized body and scalar loops. Uh, here, why not vectorize the uh, vector dependency or loop and uh, funct function in loop? I don't see it. And the ISA, um, there was a feature before uh, K and L could be accessed by too many people, uh, which is still inside that you can uh, do multi ISA binaries, and then you see the analysis, analysis for both kinds of, uh, of branches here, which is quite nice. And uh, the efficiency here for, for the loop, which is kind of a performance thermometer here to uh, indicate where we can uh, go on with work. The gain and the vector length is just four here. Um, yeah, as I said before, it's called here the performance thermometer. Thermometer is the efficiency and uh, we want to know why the efficiency is low and uh, probably uh, reasons we have talked already about and most of the time it's in the memory access, I would say. So we can go on and we can probably just order our loops by the efficiency and then uh, look where we have uh, low efficiency and uh, go through the recommendations here and you see that even uh, you are given uh, more flex like the uh, co-opt assume safe padding and uh, you can can read this and you will guide it you will be guided to further uh, documentation to uh, efficiently work on these problems uh, by using the vector advisor here um, 
So where did I lose my 45% here? Of course, uh, just the factors, which is just the more or less the same, same slide that we've seen before about inefficient vectorization. And then we can uh, get here the uh, further recommendations which are linked to uh, this typical stuff, the recommendations, and this memory stuff with the indirect address, uh, memory access, and memory subset system latency uh, we can get by uh, getting the memory access pattern. And for that we have to do another run. Uh, let me just say the people who know VTune, you just do per experiment one project, one result directory. In Advisor, uh, you accumulate the results in one project directory. So you take always the same project directory and accumulate it by first making the survey with the timings. Then you uh, get the trip counts and the flop counts and will be added to the same display that we saw before. Then we get another column for the flops and for other stuff uh, that has been added. And if you want to take a, uh, a snapshot, then it's a tool that's uh, a, uh, a knob that, or you can do it with command line as well. You can take a real snapshot of your program by generating one uh, directory or one, uh, one file that contains all the stuff of uh, all the stuff uh, of your experiments so far and archive it. So a previous, when, you, when you're finished with one step, you can take this snapshot and pull it on your laptop and you can even view it with the advisor on your laptop than the snapshot uh, because it contains, or will automatically contain then uh, the executable and the necessary source code. So that's a nice feature for uh, taking the snapshots of documenting your work. Um, yeah, another things like traits, so are also mentioned here for in the loop analytics section. And there is the uh, special AVX 512 performance inside you get uh, this uh, additional profiling here, uh, you get the flops and the mask output, so it calculates for you the uh, gigaflops with the trip count. Um, you need to set a flag for it, but uh, you get the gigaflops here. Uh, you get the arithmetic intensity, which will be later be interesting for the roofline analysis, which is for each loop the number of uh, the ratio between the flops that you calculate for each byte that you load independent from where you, you load it. Um, this is the arithmetic intensity. Uh, then you get another column for the mask utilization. So it can be that there is a, a mask by an if statement uh, that masks out certain elements of your vector here and only uses part of the, uh, the vector elements. So this is interesting information as well. So if you have a low mask utilization, you might think of uh, changing your algorithm to uh, pack your vectors uh, more, more tightly. Um, so the ISAR is shown, the efficiency, the potential or the gain. The estimated gain are the vector length and here's some traits where you can uh, click on or that gives you something uh, to think of. So here we have FMA and we have mask manipulations. Uh, we have here reciprocals and we can think of uh, doing some uh, lower um, precision algorithmics here for the reciprocals and there is some overview here about the instruction set 
and it tells me, for example, that 24% of the instructions are memory instructions and 38 compute and 38 other instructions. And then you see you have here this triangle in before you can click on it and then it will tell you if it's uh, scalar memory access or if it's vectorized memory access. So you get here some uh, nice overview about the features here in uh, your loops. Uh, vectorization with high efficiency. So the efficiency might not be enough information because it can be uh, efficiently vectorized but with the low mask utilization. So it can be uh, that you, or you have to look at the mask utilization as well. Or another point is that you have to look if your uh, loop is uh, really um, vector bound or if it's or compute bound or if it's uh, memory bound. So this is another thing that you have to look and take into account. Uh, so this is the uh, survey loop analytics here with the instruction mix and uh, you can click on the memory for example to see how this unfolds and it tells you here 90% is only vector uh, memory operations and the rest here is uh, scalar operations. And then you can go into the, uh, the map analysis that shows you the memory access and I know the code from where it is taken and you see here it's uh, these strides uh, listed. You see here the source code and it lists here the strides for the memory access. Zero is just that it's uh, taking more or less a scalar, oh sorry, always the same uh, value and three is uh, there's an obvious uh, explan explanation because it's uh, using coordinates and you have here three-dimensional coordinates and you have the stride three for the three-dimensional coordinates. Uh, by the way, this example here is uh, um, is a good, it was even used to try this done uh, the, um, the SDTL uh, stuff for the AOS to SOA uh, uh, transformation. So there is a tutorial which uses this code here, uh, which in the final uh, step of the tutorial you apply this uh, transformation from SOA to AOS, from array of structs to struct of arrays. Um, so this is uh, here the stride 3 for the coordinates, but you have here uh, this red button means that it is a, um, indirect access and you have an unpredictable memory access, which is the worst thing here because you have to uh, generate more complicated uh, code for that to, to cope with uh, these excesses. And you see here the operand types is ints and here floats, uh, operand size, okay, but then you see the aggregated footprint and you see the number of bytes that are aggregated here uh, with, uh, with each call and you see here only 88 bytes but here you see for this indirect access 9 megabytes. So it's, uh, it's a good sign here that you have to uh, find out how to deal with this indirect access. And it can be even shown here in assembly uh, with the stride and the addresses and here's the memory access. So this is very valuable to uh, have a deep analysis of uh, why the vectorization efficiency is 
is not as you would have expected or if you like you would like to have it. Um, here's some metrics that shows you here the footprint. Here you have the unit stride, uh, the uh, fixed stride, and here you have the irregular excess. If it's small enough, then everything should work fine here. If it's a big vector, you might run into uh, bandwidth bottlenecks. Uh, probably you have to use some kind of blocking or other strategies to cope with this uh, memory excess. Um, constant stride, um, you might have uh, latency bottlenecks. Uh, medium SMD, uh, you have latency and bandwidth bottlenecks, probably. And the worst is the irregular excess, and you have a bad SIMD uh, with gathers and scatters, I would say, it has possible latency bottlenecks. And if it's big enough, then you have all kinds of bad SIMD and a latency bottleneck. So this could be one identification here with the uh, small strides and here uh, we see a small, sorry, uh, with a big aggregated footprint, uh, you see that you are somewhere here with the bad SIMD4 and the latency bottleneck. Um, now let's come to the roofline analysis. So we have uh, our loops and we want to now uh, see how far can we go with the loops and what's the potential in optimizing these loops. And the roof line uh, starts here on the right side by printing here the uh, peak performance, floating point performance. So the y-axis is gigaflops per second and here is the top performance. So it will be refined later by uh, showing several kinds of top performance depending on the instruction used, but let's take here the peak performance first. And here is the uh, arithmetic intensity, it's called, it's flop per byte. So it means uh, when you have a loop, how many flops can be calculated per read byte. Uh, and when you're on the right side, when you have a high arithmetic intensity, uh, then the, um, the memory system can always um, load all the data in, in the right time, and so you have no problems with the memory system, and uh, you should go for the peak performance here of your system. When you are uh, on the left side with a low arithmetic intensity, uh, then you are bounded by your peak bandwidth. So it's more or less that you can take the, uh, the flop per bytes value and multiply it by your peak bandwidth and then you will go something up there to see where your kernel, what your kernel can achieve with this arithmetic intensity. So we have three kernels. So this one is clearly, uh, these two ones are bandwidth. Uh, limited, uh, but this one is near to the to this roof here, to the peak bandwidth. So there is not much potential if you don't change the algorithm uh, radically and uh, get a higher arithmetic intensity. And for the second kernel, is is lower, and you see you have quite a potential here to go up to the roof here, and you can. Uh, apply certain methodologies to uh, get higher. At least you have some potential here to optimize the loop. While in that case you uh, have to do a real heavy lifting or it's not possible to uh, get much higher. So this one would be almost peak performance uh, which shows you then that you cannot go any further, so you can. Uh, it's probably not a good target to, to spend any, any time longer on this loop. 
So as I said, here for kernel 2, you have the biggest potential and you might either get with the same arithmetic intensity to, to the bandwidth roof here or if you have a higher arithmetic intensity by probably uh, changing the structure, then you can uh, probably even go to the peak performance. So there's a big gap for optimization. If you're in that region, uh, you have a lower potential. So it helps you, the roofline analysis helps you to take the decision what to do next or which loop to tackle on uh, next. So the concept overview, the classic roof line, I have had a little look into the paper. So it's, uh, the difference is that you were taking in previous times the operational intensity, which is here uh, how many flops you can calculate with each byte from DRAM. So the, uh, I would say what the difference is later, but here it really uh, depends on the DRAM. And the problem is when you change the size of the, uh, the data set or so, uh, the uh, amount of data from DRAM might change. So you have uh, different kinds of analysis for different problem sizes here, which should be avoided in uh, the newer uh, roofline analysis. But in this one, it was just uh, the operational intensity was in relation to uh, the pure DRAM uh, or the flops from DRAM. So if you have a good cache blocking or uh, yeah, good, good reuse in, inside your caches, uh, then uh, the operational intensity would go up here. But uh, we would prefer to have the same analysis uh, for each code independent of the workload size. So that would mean we uh, go to the uh, cache aware version of the uh, roofline analysis, uh, which has several roofs here. So we have the blue line is still the peak performance on top of it. But then we have uh, here the DRAM, um, the the DRAM speed here of 10 gigabytes per second. Uh, this is per core here, I guess. And you have the L1 per core uh, performance, which is, which is much higher, and you can uh, reach much higher performance. And for example, if you have the uh, algorithmic intensity of 1 and 10 gigabytes per second, then we should end up here at something or like 10 gigaflops then. So it's uh, just the um, flops divided by bytes multiplied by bytes divided by seconds. So how does it look like in the tool? The tool does everything for you automatically and uh, it, it calculates the arithmetic intensity for each loop and then it also calculates the uh, flops for each loop. And then it will put uh, a little uh, bullet here for each of, the, uh, each of your loops. And to not getting loose, lost here, you, um, these uh, loops are colored. So you see here the red loops are the most impacting, they're using most of the time. So you are guided here which loops are most impacting. And if you have a red loop uh, that's very low here in the diagram, it's a good candidate to, uh, to look further into it and to spend more work on these kinds of loops. And it's highly configurable, so you can uh, give your own, own limits what means, uh, what is a red, a yellow, or a green, green loop for you. And then you see you have different kinds of, of roofs here, uh, which are different because of different arithmetics. So first roof would be here the scalar at, the, uh, that you can, the highest speed that you can reach just by issuing scalar ads. Then the next roof would be uh, the double precision vector at peak, what you can reach 
uh, with um, um, just with vectorized add operations and the highest roof for the peak performance a factor of two higher is than the FMA peak where you have uh, really been using FMA vector operations. So you have can plot the three roofs here and you can uh, plot three or four or even more uh, roofs on that side here for the uh, for the bandwidth and it starts of course with the DRAM bandwidth here as the lowest line. Um, so this is the main line Z1 here and then comes the L3 bandwidth, the L2 bandwidth and the highest is the L1 bandwidth. So you get the best performance when everything is really coming from the L1 cache. Um, yes and to your information, if you are using uh, K and L, you will see another line for the MCD RAM. So it will print in the MCD RAM as well, and you see what's my roof for the MCD RAM. Um, oops. What's now? Uh, Hans, your battery is low. Sorry for that. Um, so the x-axis is the uh, arithmetic intensity. So it's just the uh, the number of flops that cal can be calculated for each byte where it's independent if the byte comes from DRAM or if it comes from uh, don't know, sorry. Uh, DRAM or if it comes from, from any cache. So this is a difference to the classical uh, roof line that it's uh, independent of uh, the source of the memory. And uh, then we have uh, different classes of applications. So, okay, sorry. <laughs> I was going out of the, uh, the movie. Um, so you have different kinds of codes and different in uh, arithmetic intensities. And the best ones are, of course, the uh, dense linear algebra stuff with the very high uh, arithmetic intensity. So there's much data reuse. Every byte that's read is uh, used for many calculations. Or the, some particle methods might have even better characteristics. Uh, then in the mid-range, you have something like FFTs and the uh, worst stuff is uh, sparse blast uh, stuff, uh, stencils, or uh, latest Boltzmann methods, where you have intensities below one, arithmetic intensities, and which means that you are uh, bandwidth bound in these applications. So again, the uh, ingredients of the roof line automatization are then something about the flops. Uh, you can do, as I said before, everything with command line when you're on the cluster. And I would suggest to, to work with or learn how the command line works and uh, get the results with the command line, uh, draw them to your laptop or workstation and then work on the graphical tool uh, with the results. So that's for me the most uh, convenient way of working. But here are the command lines and you uh, get a workflow if you are starting with the GUI. And the top one is the uh, collect of survey. Um, next would be the trip count and the flops in a, in a different run. Uh, Flops is currently integrated with strip counts. Um, yeah, it's quite demanding and we uh, 
can expect factors of slowdown uh, for, the, um, for the analysis. But the good thing is that the technology is uh, more or less independent of the platform and you can use it on Nihalem as well as on KNL because uh, it uses not the performance registers like VTune but it uses uh, an instrumentation library based on the pin tools from Intel uh, which can impose other other problems because we had, for example, uh, seen one problem where at the HRLS in Stuttgart they wanted to, on the Cray to take uh, advisor trip counts and it crashed and my colleagues uh, have analyzed the situation and saw that the file system of Cray did not support one call they needed for the pin instrumentation. So uh, these are kinds of very difficult to analyze but uh, they managed now to, that the trip counts can be taken on the Lustra file system of this machine. So then uh, they got a new version that can do this. Um, so the, uh, the flops cannot be taken with VTune, for example, for KNL. But here, uh, through the instrumentation, it can be taken even on KNL. Uh, which is good, currently mapped to function loops and workloads. So we have here the total gigaflops and then we, we have here split for every loop the, uh, the number of gigaflops and the arithmetic intensity is also calculated. Then it's the gigabyte per second measured and the total number of flops. Uh, so we have seen situations where uh, the uh, users complained that their own flop counting was a little bit different and we are now uh, looking into it if uh, who's right and <laughs> so no tool is uh, really bug free so we have to, to check if everything is counted correctly here. So that's again uh, the, the difference between survey and trip counts, uh, what you can do here with survey seconds and with trip count, the flops and the trip counts. Uh, mask utilization can be very interesting. So uh, when you co uh, compute here with full vectors, everything is okay. But if you have a condition that uh, only five uh, elements are taken out of uh, the whole vector, uh, then you get a, a reduced mask utilization, but probably a very good, a, the tool will show you a very good efficiency because uh, complying to the mask utilization, the efficiency works very well. So that's something that could be uh, confusing that you have a good efficiency, but because the mask utilization is low, uh, you don't get a uh, very uh, high uh, gigaflop numbers from it. So one information at, is how to, to get these roofs. So the roofs are not, uh, are not taken from, from, uh, from memory or are not stored anywhere. They are measured with micro, micro benchmarks every time you start the tool. So uh, you have to look that uh, there's nothing to uh, disturb it, but uh, it will try, gives us the most reliable results then here for, for this roofs by taking the micro benchmarks like uh, probably a small impact and, oh, no, small DGEM, sorry, a uh, DGEM run and uh, a stream run here to, to get all these roofs. So this would be again the difference between the cache aware and the uh, classical roof line. So here by, with the classical roof line uh, you uh, take uh, as bandwidth the bandwidth to DRAM only. So you measure the uh, operational intensity which is the 
ratio of flops per bytes uh, read from DRAM. And in contrast to that is the, uh, the new cache aware uh, methodology which just takes the uh, bytes that taking from the each memory subsystem. The advantage is uh, that here you get uh, different pictures for, for different workload sizes of each code. So you can take the same code and with a larger workload but get different uh, operational intensities for the loops. While here you get uh, for each workload uh, always the same operational intensity. Uh, sorry, this is the Oh, this is the here the um, algorithmic intensity. Uh, yes, that's just repeating what we have already talked about. So, how far are we from from the peak? Uh, can we do better? Uh, where are we in our optimization? What are the limiting factors? Uh, can be uh, sought out by other previous uh, analysis. Uh, that's the workload if you're working with the GUI. So it looks like VTune, um, you have to define the executable of the working directory, but don't forget here if you want to see the flops to, to mark this box here to get the collection of flops. And this is, has uh, a, a flag in, inside the command line that does the same if you want to do that in command line. So you can do the, the roof line analysis even in command line if you take a survey and the trip count with the flops and load the data into the GUI, then you can uh, do the uh, roof line analysis from that. So you can even do roof line analysis uh, with uh, the command line interface. Uh, so that would be the roof line GUI. Looks a little bit confusing, but if you uh, see here at the C three lines here and click on it, you get the configuration menu, and then you can take off some of these roofs that you don't need. For example, here are all the roofs of single precision and double precision and you can, if you know the precision, you can sort out, for example, the double and only look at the single roofs and here, for example, if you're only interested in the relation to DRAM, if all the loops are below the DRAM uh, roof here, then you can uh, just exclude the other ones. It looks a little bit different, so here uh, when you click on the survey report, you have on the right side another bottom, big bottom that says switch to roof line and you go, can go from survey to roof line and vice versa by clicking on this bottom on, on the left side. Um, yeah, the picture we saw in the beginning. The optimization directions uh, when you're here, then you can concentrate further on uh, vectorization, probably through unrolling or uh, on the threading part. When you're in, in that direction, you have to look more for the memory subsystem. And probably prefetching, so I learned that prefetching can be very valuable on K and L, and yet you should consider to use prefetching for your code. Uh, if you are memory bound. Uh, yeah, it's automated here in Advisor. So you can click on each loop here in this diagram and then you can go to the source, uh, the assembly and get the recommendations and so on for, for the loop of interest. Here we have the, uh, on the lower left side, the purely cache or DRAM bound part. And in opposite to that, on the far left side, you have the poorly uh, com 
purely compute bound stuff. And then you have something in between like more compute bound or more DRAM bound. So you can take your decisions from uh, where your loop lies. If it lies in any of the quadrants, then you can take different decision on what you want to uh, improve in the future. So here on the left lower side, you have the big optimization gap. And here on the upper one, uh, directly under the roofs, you have, of course, only low optimization uh, gain that you can have. Um, bup, bup. Uh, we have the interactive mapping to source and performance profile. Uh, there's a synergy between the vector advisor and the roof line. So uh, the roof line insights are, uh, of course, influencing the uh, workflow of advisor and vice versa. And so uh, this is a good thing to include both uh, analysis in, in one tool. And uh, last but not least, we have this customizable chart. Here you see what I meant before, that you can, uh, can select different uh, roofs here. And uh, it's covered here by uh, that you can uh, determine which loops should be yellow and red and so on to, to make analysis more easy for you. Um, I haven't asked if this is still, because this um, goes quite a while, but probably because we now have uh, the evaluations for, for the 18th version, uh, you can send an email to that address here and uh, work close, more closely with the developers together. I think people from NERSC also are delivering much information and like to work uh, with these guys here from Vector Advisor. And there's a, a very ambitious uh, colleague from, uh, uh, from the, uh, the architect, so to say, of, uh, of Advisor who is uh, really doing a lot of work and really uh, alert to uh, get the best optimizations into this tool. So it's probably worthwhile to, if you're interested, to send a request to these people here. So just in the, in the end, so you can also, if you have this collection of loops, uh, you can filter it by looking only at the scalar loops, and which are here to the, to the lower ground and left with uh, less arithmetic intensity, and the other side would be to have only the vector loops. Um, mask profiler, so you see uh, it can uh, deliver you the mask utilization, and here you see the loop that looks best from the, or looks very good from the efficiency and arithmetic intensity, or best from the arithmetic intensity, shows up to have the worst mask utilization. So you have to look at all the factors to get the, the complete picture here. Uh, yeah, you have here the low population and low for, uh, performance in spite of the high SEMD efficiency. Uh, normally, you can uh, order this by the arithmetic intensity to see uh, goes with the efficiency and uh, order your loops by that. So legal disclaimer, uh, not so interesting. Any further questions? Yes, please. Uh, I have a question about the, the roof line. Yeah. So um, how do you compute the peak uh, bandwidth because, for example, if you just go for a string like thing, <coughs> you will see, for example, for the DRAM that there is a difference between the read and the write bandwidth, which is not exactly real because of the write allocate cases. So, what does Intel Advisor uh, 
take into consideration for that. So because if I have a code that basically writes a lot to the memory, then I might not hit the theoretical line there because uh, I'm also doing some implicit loads. Mm -hmm. Does this is accounted for from the cache aware model? I understand that for the caches this doesn't make sense. But for the caches, if you are in the cache, but if you are in the your workload is on the main memory, then the right allocate policy could also affect the, the Yeah, good good basically. point, but I think it's not that fine fine grained the analysis. Probably it would be a good addition to the tool to uh, distinguish between the read and the write. Okay. So uh, we can, I, I can make a feature re yeah. request for that. I might try such an example to see if, if because by default the, if you expect string, for example, when you write, mm -hmm. uh, to be memory bound. So I'm going to try it and see if it goes exactly on the DRAM. Good point. <coughs> so if, if we do some practical uh, experiments and if you have uh, installed it here in one, um, one of sure, yeah. Yeah, feature for sure is installed. Because I think the the learning curve is much uh, steeper on advisor than on VTune. Okay, thank you.